Plant friends, I think we all know that there are a lot of lessons to be learned in the garden. And that's twofold. That's literally how to garden and how to grow food and reconnect with our food chain and deepen our relationship with nature, but also the life lessons that we learn in the garden that I'm sure you're all familiar with that I wax poetic about on the Plant Side Chat series on this podcast. I am so excited to deepen my gardening knowledge this summer with my first garden series on the Bloom and Grow Radio podcast, where I troubleshoot and try my first shot at outdoor gardening outside of the tiny balcony garden that I have had since I've launched this show. So I'm going to be bringing on different gardening experts throughout the season to talk to and figure out how the heck do I take my indoor plant knowledge, my container plant knowledge, and move it outdoors into raised beds. So when I realized I wanted to do a raised bed garden, I knew I needed to talk to Nicole from Gardenary. She is an amazing gardener and actually a teacher of garden coaches, and she builds the most beautiful raised beds that look like art in a lawn. I asked Nicole if she would be kind enough to give me my own garden coaching as I embarked to design my first garden, and she obliged. And we had such an amazing conversation. I really feel like it was interesting. This conversation was mostly troubleshooting garden planning and garden design and how to make a tomato trellis and where to put the boxes and what configurations to put them in. But it also turned into a bit of a therapy session. And I'm interested to hear if any of it resonated with you. So my sweet plant friends, welcome to episode 120 of Blue Mangro Radio. Plant friends, I'm so excited to welcome a new sponsor to Bloom and Grow Radio, Allagash Brewing Company. My favorite craft brewery has just come out with Fine Acre Beer. It's their first year-round organic Belgian-inspired golden ale. It's the perfect beer to welcome the growing season, plant friends. Oh, so good. Fine Acres launch supports organic gardening and farming, so we are celebrating with the beer gardening with Allagash sweepstakes. It's so fun and insanely planty with over $3,000 of gardening goodies in prizes. Check the show notes for details on how to enter the sweepstakes and find an Allagash near you. Fine Acre and other Allagash beers are for drinkers 21 and over, and please drink responsibly. So thrilled to welcome back one of the original sponsors of Bloom and Grow Radio, Modern Sprout. Plant friends, you know I love Modern Sprout and their planty products, and they are always striving to connect people and plants to their fabulous lines of grow lights, seed starter kits, and all sorts of planty products that empower people to cultivate their own indoor oasis. Whether you live in a tiny studio like I used to or a sprawling cabin like I currently do, with simple, stylish, and sustainable green thumb solutions for every home. Although you've heard me talk about their grow lights and grow kits for years, we all know I'm obsessed with their grow bars in my grow shelf. They just launched new products like their seed starter kits, their gift sets, and so much more. So head to modernsprout.com to check out all their products and use code 15bloom at checkout for 15% off. Once again, that's modernsprout.com and code 15bloom gets you 15% off. Hi, plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. I know I have. Spring is in the air. I'm starting to prep my plants, wiping their leaves, repotting whoever needs to be repotted, getting my fertilizing going again. You know, we moved in the winter and my plants really kind of struggled with the transition. And I'm also realizing that our home is a lot more low light than I thought it was. Something that I think I'll make a YouTube video about in the future because I've learned a lot in the last year about understanding and measuring light. But my plants have really gone through it and they're really excited for spring and summer. And so am I with more light and ability to grow. Welcome to the growing season. And speaking of the growing season, I am just so very excited to share this awesome conversation that I had with Nicole from Gardenary. She is a really special plant lady turning into plant friend, and I can't wait to introduce you to her. Before that, I just wanted to say thank you so much to our newest Patreon plant friends, Aaron Albona, Andre Heber, Carrie Christensen, and Jane Edwards. Thank you so very much for supporting Bloom and Grow Radio on a monetary basis by becoming Patreon plant friends. You're the freaking best. If you're interested in joining, check the link in the show notes. Also, we have a very exciting launch coming up for this community, and it is all about community. I mean, like all about community. I've been working really hard behind the scenes on this launch and on this platform and product that I'm going to be bringing to you guys 
So if you want to hop on the wait list, so when I have more information I can share with you, you'll be first to get it. You can head to bloomandgrowradio.com slash community to be first in the know. All right, this conversation was so good and a little long. I learned a lot. I hope you learn a lot. And I hope that if you are outdoor gardening this summer, growing your own food, that you tag me in your post on Instagram because I want to get inspired by your setups as well. And I can't wait to show you mine. Okay, here's Nicole. Hello, Nicole. Welcome to Bloom and Grow Radio. Hi, Maria. I'm so excited to be here. It's taken three months. But we're here. But here we are. Perfect timing. You're definitely one of my favorite new plant friends that I've made digitally over the last year. What you've built over at Gardenary is so cool. And I'm so honored that you agreed to give me a garden coaching today. Of course, this is going to be so fun. I haven't gotten to garden coach with that many people in your part of the country. So this is going to be really fun to chat through. Awesome. We are both still experiencing this cold. You're in Chicago, right? Yes. Uh huh. So we both have those brutal winters that we just got to like patiently wait through. What's your zone? You know, it's so funny. I actually don't do zones. <laughs> oh, right. You don't do zones. I think I'm like zone five B-ish or something like that. Yeah, that's me too. Essentially, we leave frost dates like late April or early to mid-March. Like when I moved here, most everybody's like, Mother's Day, Mother's Day, Mother's Day. Like that's the time you can plant. Mm -hmm. But you know me, like I break all those rules. So I plant yes. myself in February, not like summer stuff, but I try to, yes. I was like literally shoveling snow off my beds this winter. I was so done. I was so jealous on your Instagram. You had that funny video of you shoveling the snow off your beds and like starting to prep. And I was like, oh man, I wish I could be doing that. I know, you know, two years ago this time, I didn't have the beds. We were new to Chicago at that point. We moved here from Houston and I hadn't put my beds in yet. I had my book deal. So my mom's like, literally like, Nicole, get in motion, like get that bed <laughs> going. You can't write a book without a garden outside your door. And I really miss that early part of the spring. A lot of us don't realize that that's a fantastic time. So even for any of your listeners, if they are hearing this podcast, like in the fall or even at the end of the summer for them not to assume that it's over, actually like Anytime, I love to say this, actually, anytime is a great time to put in a garden. And the, the sooner you can get in, even if it's at the very end of the year, it means you're going to get to start so much faster than if you were to wait all the way till the next spring. Totally. I'm totally experiencing that itch right now because I moved in the middle of the winter. I have to wait till the ground thaws until it's a little bit warmer to get our garden set up for a myriad of reasons. And I'm just dying to get growing. But up here... I've connected with a bunch of local gardeners and they've all advised to wait till June that last year we had a frost on May 27th. We're pretty cold. So, okay, we just dove in and I want to actually talk to you. I'm obsessed with your book. I've read it several times. I want to talk to you about the way that you kind of don't use gardening zones and kind of use seasons. But before that, like, who are you? How did you become the plant lady you are today? For those listeners who don't know about you and the amazing work you're doing at Gardenary. Yeah. I'm Nicole Burke. I'm somewhat of a, what do you call those people that move around a lot? A nomad. A nomad. Okay. I'm a happy nomad. I've lived so many places. That really is part of the reason, part of my story. Born in the South, Mississippi. My grandfather was the head of horticulture at Mississippi State, but I was forced to do lawn work and stuff for my family. I'm one of two girls. And I swore to my parents, like, I'm going to have a yard of gravel, like don't ever put me in the yard ever when I grow up. <laughs> anyway, fast forward after college, I actually lived in China for two years. I was a business major, but I lived doing like volunteer type work in China. And I was exposed for the first time to local food, like literally in the area where I lived, the food changed every two to three months based on what these people were growing and harvesting. And I didn't even realize I didn't have words for it. But the, for the first time, I actually watched the idea of harvest to table, like right in front of my eyes. So that impacted me, but I had no idea kind of, you know, how things happen to you, like subconsciously, mm -hmm. <laughs> like gets in your brain. Totally. Anyway, fast forward years, I was married or I am married to Jason. He's a scientist. He's a chemist, actually an organic chemist. And so our marriage has brought us to a lot of different places because he's like for his education and training and everything. So we got married in Philly. Then we moved to Charlottesville, Virginia at UVA. That's where we had our first two kids. Then we moved to Nashville. That's where we had our second two kids. He worked at Vanderbilt there. 
And then we lived in Houston for five and a half years. And I like to say I had no kids there. I was done (laughs) with the kids, (laughs) but I had two businesses. So when we lived in Houston, I started my first company called Rooted Garden. Our family, we had started just trying our hand at gardening. I was at home all the time with my four young kids. I had four kids in like four and a half years. It was a little crazy. Bravo. I was kind of losing myself, to be honest, Maria. Like I had been working and then I wasn't working as much, just kind of on the side with all these kids. And I don't know, I was in my early thirties and I was just home a lot. And I was trying to figure out who I was, like, what is my adult life going to look like? And I didn't really have an answer for that. And we just, I think we were at my parents' house. My parents live in Mississippi and My mom had cherry tomatoes in the backyard and my young daughter, my oldest daughter was picking some. She was like three or four at the time. And I just was like, let's try a garden. And so we, it was so bad timing. Speaking of timing, it was like July in Nashville. We lived on a total sloping hill. We were renting. We didn't even ask permission to dig a garden. (laughs) Very few things worked that summer, but something just kind of came alive in me, like going out there and watching those plants grow from seed and seeing how dynamic they yep. were. And it was like, I mean, it sounds so trite or whatever, but it's kind of life-changing for me. And when I was home all the time, it became this like place I could go that was outside and not connected to laundry or the kitchen <laughs> or the dishwasher. So that sparked like a love for me for the garden. And when we moved to Houston, that was like one of our major focuses was setting up a garden. So anyway, I fell in love with it so much so that in 2015, I was like, I want to teach other people how to do this. So I started a company called Rooted Garden and our focus is kitchen gardens. So we do raised bed, organic kitchen garden installations. So we go into a client's home, like look at their space, talk about their desires, teach them what grows when in Houston. And then we design these lovely, beautiful, that's two words that mean the same thing, but really really gorgeous raised beds for them. And then we install them and teach them how to tend and care for them. So that business took off. I love Instagram. It was like a fun place to share. I didn't even have an iPhone. This is the longest intro ever, but I'm going to get to the point. (laughs) I didn't even have an iPhone. I didn't even have a smartphone until 2014. Like literally was texting on a flip phone until then. Amazing. And then suddenly I started a business and I had Instagram. So it was pretty funny, but I shared a lot of the work we were doing on Instagram. And from that, I heard from so many people, not just in Houston, but around the country who said one of two things. One, I am a gardener and I want to start a business like yours. How do I do it? And then I heard from other people who said, do you know of a business like yours in my town? Mm -hmm. And like this light bulb went off and I was like, I love what I do. I can't believe this is my job. And I want to help other women actually was the main thought in my head. I want to help other women like me start their own businesses too. So in 2017, I started Gardenary, which is the company that helped me find you. And (laughs) my dream is really that Gardenary is the Airbnb of gardening. So just like if you wanted to stay in some certain place or go someplace, you would be trying to find someone who has a great place for you to stay in that area or like Uber, you know, all these platform businesses where you can find a specialist, you can find someone in an area that can offer you what you need. That Gardenery is the same idea. So for you, that you could go onto the Gardenery platform and you could find a garden coach that I've trained with the Gardenery style and they could come and help you specific to where you live. Because as we know, gardening is so local. Yep. That's who I am. That's how I got where I am today. I'm going to shout out, we have a common mentor, Brooke Castillo. She has a great free podcast called Life Coaching School. What's the it called? The Life Coach School, yeah. The Life Coach School. So shout out, Brooke Castillo. We love you. Yeah, that was pretty funny. We like connected and we were like talking all these deep things and we were like, do you like really? the Life Coach School? Because we kind of <laughs> talked about the same thing. Yeah, I signed up. I became a self-coaching scholar. I gave myself that for my birthday last year, 2019. Little did I know how much I was going to need that for 2020. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually going through certification starting next week. Very cool. Yeah. It's a self-coaching kind of modality and she's amazing. Her podcast is a great place to start and we both members of her community. Yeah. But yes, when we first met and I was a guest on Nicole's podcast, before we started recording, we both had green smoothies. We both like said a few 
key words, like we both kind of connected like spiritually. We were like, huh, so this is a deeper connection than plants. Or maybe plants are the like, right? It's like, huh, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Yes, exactly, exactly. And now you get to help me, Nicole. I don't know what I'm doing. So you help me with my plants. I am now putting my plants in the shower. It's life-changing. I love it. (gasps) Yay, so fun. Yeah, so I guess, well, so much of what you said resonates with me. I mean, my first teensy balcony garden in my nine square feet balcony garden, man, that experience of growing my first tomato plant and watching a little teensy seedling turn into a little flower, turn into a tomato, turn into something to eat, like was a life-changing experience. And I think a lot of people listening know how profound plant care can really be, whether it's indoors or outdoors. And I'm so excited to take my next step as an outdoor gardener, like for real. And something that always drew me to you in Gardenary is just how beautiful the gardens that you design are. So I feel like I've always loved raised bed gardening because also I just feel like for my first step into gardening, I want to go hard in the paint, like in my first season, but I also don't want to overwhelm myself. And I took a soil science course with New York Botanical Garden last year. And after I learned about the testing and the amending of like the soil in ground, and my mom is an amazing gardener and she's an in-ground gardener. And I watch her like amend her soil all the time. I was like, and I'm renting this year. I was just like, that's not going to be my first garden. Maybe in the future, I'll have a farm and I'll do it indoors. But I feel like my thought for my first garden is I kind of just want to do ease, like high quality kind of pre-packaged things. Like I don't want to make things too hard for myself because I'm already just like so intimidated and kind of nervous for this first experience. So for someone who's in my position, like where do you even start? (laughs) So the raised bed, I mean, that is why we do that in Houston for all of our clients. So I would say 95% of our clients are brand new to kitchen gardening and even to gardening period. And so the raised bed for me even, so when we started that first garden in Nashville, we did an in-ground one. And then we quickly within a year transferred over to raised beds Mm -hmm. because we realized how hard, like basically in-ground gardening is long-term gardening, right? Like you're investing, like I'm going to give two to three years for this soil to turn and be ready. And then I'm going to also, it's not just time. It's also space. You're also saying like, I'm going to give these plants plenty of room to sprawl because they don't have a ton of space to go down with their roots. So row gardening and in-ground gardening is awesome. It's fine. I mean, we've done it for thousands of years, obviously, as human beings. But as we get more and more people on the planet and our spaces get smaller, raised beds to me just makes so much sense. And for me, I don't know if I'll ever go back because even like I set up gardens for my mom. And she's like, I can't get in the ground anymore. Like she's in her Mm -hmm. mid to late sixties. And for her, a two foot garden bed makes it possible and accessible for her. So anyway, for you, what I would say, I love to say minimum, like for any of your listeners too, like minimum size, I think to just get your feet wet and to start learning, I say a 16 square feet. So you can do a lot of different arrangements. You could do a four by four, you could do a two by eight. I would not recommend doing a one by 16. So generally you want to have two feet of width in your raised bed, but a two by eight, you can get a ton of space and growth in there and a four by four as well. But that's my minimum that I like to say a four by four space or at 16 square feet. And then I usually like to say, I would love for you to have an hour a week. And it probably just isn't even going to take that. And then I usually like to also ask like, about $500. So those are kind of my like, let's get you in the gate, like get you through the first gate. And that's just like a conservative estimate of just what it takes. I think a lot of times people don't even, I don't know, they're like shell shocked that it might even take $500. But I think what we often forget about food gardens or gardens in general is that because we're so detached from the production of our food and the production Mm -hmm. of plants in our society, We actually have no idea how expensive the food we eat is. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like there's that joke book about like the $63 tomato or something, you know, like Mm -hmm. that's probably so expensive. And you're like, like when you really get into the garden or you really start to study even our farm situation in the US, you realize 
some tomatoes actually do cost sixty three dollars. Like it's part of it. So those are my minimums: four by four bed, five hundred dollars one hour a week, and then we just start our clients off and our students off right away with the soil that's going to work, and then plants or seeds. So plants are going to be you probably could come in less than five hundred if you want to do a hundred percent seeds. I would recommend especially. There are certain things like our larger plants that we grow in the garden, those you're going to have so much more success if you start those with plants Mm -hmm. and then a trellis. So those are kind of like the key elements that you've got to have to grow in like just all your listeners. They could really all start with this little package. So four by four bed, great soil, good local seeds or plants, and then a trellis. And you could be off to the races. Okay. I have so many thoughts. Number one, I loved in your book, your book, Kitchen Garden Revival, you take us through all of your gardens and the progression of your gardens. And man, it's so fun to read because you really have had that evolution and it's very inspiring to be feeling like I'm about to go through that evolution. And there's something to me about raised beds that I love is like the visual of meticulous, like this very structured box with a pretty trim. And then these wild plants, like especially towards the end of the summer, like that juxtaposition feels very poetic to me. Like I think in your book, you have a name for it, like the structured and the wild. You reference it in your book, but it's very appealing to me. The other thing that I'm obsessed with that I've learned from your book is tomato trellis, which I'm definitely going to grill you about later on in our conversation. So it looks like The other favorite part of my book, sorry, this isn't just, (laughs) you're not paying me to have this episode. I just really (laughs) like your book. This, This feels like it's an ad for Kitchen Garden Revival. But you have, for me as a newbie, I got lost on Pinterest trying to like figure out what the designs of my garden are. And you have some standard recommendations for like different setups. So it looks like unofficially... I'm going to be gardening on a nine by 19 foot rectangle. That's the plot that I'm going to have to design within. So I first thought I was going to do in a different location, I was going to do your classic four with two trellises. Yeah. Now, because I have this long rectangular piece of land, mm-hmm. I'm thinking maybe three raised beds. Like what might you suggest for a long rectangular plot of land for raised beds? Yeah, I love this. So with nine feet width, that's going to be like your constraint. And for everybody listening, constraints are our friends, right? So like if you just have, a lot of times we have a space like this, like for you, Maria, you're like, oh, bummer, I can't do my poor garden classic because I'm not wide enough. But the fun thing to realize is like constraints are essential to design because Mm -hmm. they give us these borders and lines and then we have to get creative inside of them. Like I always think it's funny. I have this garden that I post on Instagram. It's to this day, still my most like famous liked post. And it is literally gardens through an alley. Like it's just like an alley against the home and everybody loves that garden. And I've discussed this with my team, with my family, like, why does everybody love this garden? It's like, because it's within a constraint. Like they love seeing how much creativity. Yeah. All space. Yeah. So all that to say, let's celebrate the fact that you have constraints because it's going to make you so much more creative. So nine feet wide. So there's a couple options. Like Is that your path? Like on the outside of that nine feet, can you step or are you literally like closed in on the nine feet? Yeah. So it's actually, it's a 10 by 20 plot of land in an open fenced area. So I will be able to be around it, but the plot is lined by these wooden planks. So I have to work within the wooden planks and that's where it makes it nine by nine, or it's really nine and a half by 19 and a half. But yes, there is space. Stand on the wooden planks and work in the garden, or is that going to be uncomfortable? I can stand on them. You could? Yeah. So that's the main thing to figure out. So like, let's say those were walls and you couldn't stand on them. Then what we would say is pretty much you're going to need to do just one width of a bed going deep, right? And so you could Mm -hmm. do like three and do a garden trio. Mm -hmm. So you could do like four foot wide beds for sure. That would give you two and a half feet on either side, which would be really nice pathways four feet wide. And then standard wood is going to be eight feet long. So if you're doing boards, I don't know what material you're going to build out of, but if you were doing boards, you could do two that were eight feet long each. So that would be 16 feet. And then that would leave you three feet for the interior, which might like, if let's pretend all those things were walls, you would need the beds to actually be shorter. Or if you wanted to pay for the lumber, like you're going to get the most growing space if you did just one huge long bed. 
the lumber for that, if you are going that direction, is going to be super expensive. If you try to get longer boards and then you need to add a lot more supports through the middle of that bed. I generally try to stay away from doing really long beds for that reason. And also like rotating my plants. I prefer things kind of broken up. Yeah. I'm renting this space for the year. So I have to break everything down after and hoping that I can set it up again in my home that we buy in a year. So I definitely want to do smaller beds. So is there a maximum width for a bed that you recommend? Because I've read online that like you don't want it over this many feet because you want to be able to like access all the plants in the bed. Is there a maximum width of the bed you recommend? And then also in between like amount of space in between the beds that you recommend? Yeah. So four feet is like industry standard. Like any article you read about raised beds is going to say four feet, generally because most of our arms are about two feet long. Okay. Duh. (laughs) Wise, it's kind of fun to play with the idea of a four and a half or five foot wide bed. If you use really nice big trellises in the center. So if you take this idea of a two foot reach, right, then you could have trellises that are like one foot wide, each like obelisk trellises. You could have this gorgeous line of obelisk trellises down the center. They're taking up a foot of a footprint, right? So you don't need to reach all the way in two and a half feet. You just have to reach to the edge of the trellis. Okay. So in your space, if you wanted to have five foot wide beds, I think it would actually work and be really pretty. And then you would just use obelisk trellises down the center. Oh my gosh. You get so much growth out of that space. Okay. So I could do four foot by six feet or four feet by eight feet beds and do three And what do you think about putting the middle one perpendicular? So having like almost an H shape, if I was to draw a line just to like add some variety, or would you suggest putting all the beds like parallel to each other? I like that idea. I think that'd be fun. Otherwise, actually, if you don't do that, I don't think you have room to fit three, right? Because you've only got 19 feet length. Mm -hmm. So if you did eight and eight, that would be 16. So that would just leave you three. I love the idea of turning it. You could do like two four by sixes and they would be six, like six feet in. You need to give yourself a little walkway at the front. So six feet in, and then you could turn a bed and that one would only take say four feet and then have another six, six, four, that would be 16. And that would leave you two feet in between bed one and two and bed two and three. And two feet is your recommendation for staying Oh, yeah, yeah. Good question. So you asked about the pathway. So like industry standard for wheelbarrow is three feet wide. So like if you're trying to get a wheelbarrow through there, generally three feet is the minimum. It actually doesn't take three feet, but it's three feet to do it comfortably. So if you know like my kitchen garden that's on the cover of my book, that pathway in the center is three feet wide. But what I was going to say to you about your garden design, if you wanted, you couldn't do all three of my beds, but you could do two of them. Like if you cut my garden at the two thirds mark, that Mm -hmm. design is actually possible for you because if you could walk on all sides, Mm -hmm. because those beds are just, my beds are two and a half feet wide. Like my garden space is 10 by 30. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted less of like straight down and more of like a pathway through the middle, you could actually do narrower beds and push them to the edge. And then you would Mm -hmm. just, like you'd have to stand kind of on the outside of your space. That makes sense. But then I could put the tomato arched trellis and have a tomato tunnel of love you could. through my garden bed. Yes. Very interesting. If you want that feeling of enclosure, then you could go with narrower beds pushed out to mm-hmm. the edge. So if you did two and a half, two and a half, that's five. So that actually leaves you with four feet. So you could do three down the center and give yourself like six inches on the outside Mm -hmm. And six inches, you can't quite put a foot in there, but you can kind of lean in. So that would keep you from having to stand. It would make it maybe a little bit more comfortable. So you could do two and a half by seven or whatever you want to do, like lengthwise, give yourself three feet down the middle and then three feet even between your beds. That's actually, you could do a four garden classic that way. It would just be narrower beds. Got it. We're talking about the four garden classic. You have very specific designs for these garden. So you're going to provide some photos that we're going to have in the blog for the show notes in case anybody is curious and needs a visual aid for this like very intense conversation we just had about this. So yeah, I also think that I'm trying to remind myself that 
my garden and my raised bed garden will be an evolution year over year. And so even though in my mind's eye, I definitely want your four bed option. I think this year it might make more sense for me to just do three, but I'm also like, I'm excited at the idea. I'm working with this amazing company, Earth Easy, that has these garden raised bed kits. And so I love the idea of like starting with three and then next year adding another one. And then all of a sudden I'm going to be Joe Lample with like a whole farm. Yeah. With, I don't know how many beds Joe has. He has like 12 or 18 beds and I think in his garden. So I want to trust to that. It's been a very interesting, you know, do you see this with a lot of your first timers? Like it's been an interesting balance of trying to figure out like what makes sense for me in my first year and also like taking on too many things and then getting overwhelmed. Like I'm so excited to be starting my tomato seeds and I'm actually going to do a half, half. I'm starting some seeds and then I'm ordering a lot of seedlings with Territorial Seed Company. But I also was like, okay, this is my first garden and I'm starting seeds. I'm figuring out beds. Like I'm doing everything at once and I'm being so intense. So do you have that like overwhelm with some of your clients? Yeah, definitely. I think so. And I think remembering that you can plant it with that in mind. I have a saying that I say in my book and I talk to all my Kitchen Garden Academy students about this, worst first. So the idea is do the hardest thing at the beginning so that you're not continuously making up for the fact that you didn't do the right thing at the beginning. And so like mindful beginnings in your garden and taking time, like what you're doing, Maria, to get set up correctly is going to immediately take off the overwhelm to get started. So for our clients that really like, that's actually one of our taglines is we take away the overwhelm when starting a kitchen garden. And we like, our goal is to give our gardeners confidence. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had actually people kind of come at me a little bit like you post these before and afters and it makes it look like the garden is instant. And I'm like, but it is. (laughs) And they're they're like, but a garden takes time. I'm like, but it doesn't have to like, I'll say like my trolls on the internet are the gardeners. I hate to say this, but like, those are Mm -hmm. the people who kind of come at me on the internet, like gardens take years to do and this and that. And like, they don't necessarily like this, this idea that things could be easy and could be fast. Mm -hmm. I respect them and their journey, but I also know that we're not going to get the whole world to garden. If we hold out that as like, this is the only way to come into the garden, which is it's going to take you years and you have to learn all this stuff. And there's this huge barrier to entry. And so I would say to you and to your listeners, like if you set it up right the first time and then even planting mindfully. So for our clients, we plant very few things that need a lot of tending. So, so many of the pieces that we put into the garden are kind of, they take care of themselves or the care that's required for them is harvesting, Mm -hmm. right? So, and then the way I plant and I talk about in my book, which is intensive planting, that also works with nature. I mean, that's how nature seeds itself. And so what we do and what gardeners come at me with on Instagram and stuff is like, it needs all this time and all this watering and weeding and that kind of thing, but it doesn't necessarily have to. So I don't know. I'm kind of, I am not like a mainstream. I didn't grow up doing this and I just taught myself. So I wasn't like looking to everybody out. Like I didn't read a lot of books and stuff like that. When I started my company, I was really just coming from my own experience, which is more playful. Like I just had a very curious approach mm-hmm. to the garden. Like, oh, I want to grow that. Let me try it. Or I want to plant these things this way. Let me see what happens. And so it gave me, I think, a really unique perspective on the garden. And it can kind of be a little disarming, I think, or maybe put some people up in arms. but. For you, what I would say, like, if you set it up right, that's going to take, that's like 90% of the work that you have to do through the season yeah. and then planting things like herbs and greens. And like, when you pick your plants, picking like just a minimum amount that need lots of tending, and then let's plant a lot of things that are cut and come again, that are perennials or that are going to take care of themselves so that your garden looks full and it's like overflowing, but that doesn't mean that you have to be out there every hour taking care of it. So our clients, yeah. even their bigger gardens, I mean, they go out to the garden to harvest. And then when they're out there harvesting, they might do some tending, but the main draw is to go out and pick. 
Yeah, I'm reminding myself of that and knowing that the investment and stress I'm putting in now is totally going to pay off this summer. Thank you, Allagash Brewing Company, for sponsoring today's episode. Plan friends. Oh my God. Allagash Brewing Company is this amazing brewery and B Corporation out of Portland, Maine, and they have just come out with the most delicious beer. It's called Fine Acre and it's organic. It is seriously the perfect accompaniment to your indoor or outdoor gardening practices this spring and summer. We've been drinking it as it's been getting warmer and loving it. And the cool thing is it's organic and it's actually certified organic by the Maine Organic Farmer and Gardeners Association, and it is so tasty. We all love organic gardening products, so why not love organic beer, right? Okay, so for you beer aficionados, it's a gorgeously balanced Belgian-inspired golden ale. But for you non-beer aficionados like me, it's light, it's bright, it's crisp, and served cold. It is seriously so delicious. I've really been enjoying it. So this is going to be our springtime go-to beer for winding down on our new porch and taking a stroll in the garden, baby. And such exciting news to celebrate the launch of Fine Acre, which is a beer that celebrates organic gardening and farming. I'm so excited to share that I'm partnering with Allagash for their Beer Gardening with Allagash Sweepstakes. Plant friends, the winner gets so many things, so many fun free things, including a free plant consultation with me, a full hour consultation with me over Zoom, a $300 gift card to Bloonscape. That's $300 worth of free plants shipped directly to your door, a $100 Allagash merch gift card, and the chance to direct $2,500 to a community garden nonprofit of your choice. So for more information on this awesome sweepstakes and fine acre, check the show notes for details on how to enter and how to find an Allagash near you. Fine acre and other Allagash beers are for drinkers 21 plus. Please drink responsibly. Okay, plant friends, my love affair with Modern Sprout and their planty products is no secret to this community. It began several years ago when I first installed their grow bar into a bookshelf of mine. And their grow bar is an efficient full spectrum LED light that you can just pop into a bookshelf under a cabinet, wherever you really want to put it, you can do it. And it turned my very low light area of my home into this high light planty oasis. And Modern Sprout has really been an innovator in the grow light space since the beginning. And they design grow lights that are not only super functional, that make our plants happy, but super beautiful. And they look like art in our homes. I mean, seriously. They now have their smart lights that are not only gorgeous, but they're also super functional. They connect to the Modern Sprout app where you can control the timer and light levels from your phone. Plus, they have a three-year warranty. I know we've seen this IKEA greenhouse cabinet hack going around the internet and the sleek, smart grow bar with its white metal design that like goes flush right up against the bottom of a shelf would be perfect for your own DIY grow shelf IKEA situation if you're interested. Also, speaking of gardening, Modern Sprout has launched their seed starter trio sets and they are perfect for seed starting season and they are so adorable. They make the greatest gift because the packaging is so freaking cute. Each seed starter trio comes with everything you need to start the seeds indoors and transplant them directly into your garden in the little pots that you actually start the seeds in. And they have three adorable curated packages right now. So they have Patio Punch, Watermelon, Strawberry, and Mint, Mighty Mini, Dwarf Cucumber, Baby Eggplant, and Cherry Tomato tomato and green goddess, which is spinach, kale, and Swiss chard. I have barely scratched the surface on all of the amazing things that Modern Spread has to offer, our planty collections and planty personalities. Everything they have on their website is so giftable. The packaging is awesome. They're an awesome company. So you've got to check it out, especially with Mother's Day coming. So head to modernsprout.com and check out all of their products and use code 15 bloom at checkout for 15% off. So once again, that's code 15 bloom at checkout for 15% off at modernsprout.com. My mom is an unbelievable gardener. We come from a a lineage of Italian farmers and she does edible landscaping. So our whole front yard last summer is tomatoes and like lettuces and sunflowers. Like she doesn't landscape with like normal plants or non-edible plants. Starting my seeds this year, I was really in my head about it. And I think it's in part because I am sharing my first experience publicly with everyone. But I was in my head and I was like, am I doing this right? I'm going to kill all these seeds. I'm going to put all these seeds in and they're all going to die. And this is going to be a whole thing. And I called my mom and she was like, Maria, it's a seed. It goes in the earth and it grows. Like you're not part of it. Like it intrinsically is designed to do its thing. Like put the seed in the earth and it's going to grow. And that kind of reminder from her was really helpful because I think, and what a beautiful parallel in life. We can get 
so in our heads about so many things. And really at the end of the day, like what plants teach us is what's naturally going to unfurl and grow and unfold, like is going to grow. And also if I planted all my seeds and none of them made it, that's a lesson in whatever I did wrong to have them all damp off or whatever else. So just needed to have that moment of just letting my neuroses out with you. So thank you for holding space for me. Well, I Um, I have a saying in my book too called Think About Nature. And I use it actually in my chapter about soil, but it's actually, I teach this concept all the time to my Kitchen Garden Academy students and my root of garden clients that think about nature, like take a moment when you're stressed, like your mom essentially said that, like this is a seed. And what I have been learning and discovering really over the last five years is what is the plant want? It's kind of a fun thing to think about. Plants want to regenerate themselves and create more of their species. Like they're literally designed in their DNA to want to spread their species across the earth. And they have a couple of really cool attributes that we don't have in the animal kingdom. One is that they feed themselves. They're autotrophs, right? So they can take sunlight and they feed themselves. I mean, that is crazy. That's cool. That's so cool. cool. Yeah. And then they also have within themselves the ability to turn themselves into literally thousands of replications, right? And so They also have like a suicide ability where if a part of them is injured or hurt, they will literally just let it die off and then create new ones. That's how we can propagate plants, right? Like in your indoor plant world, that's that a crazy ability of the plant that they can just be like, okay, you're dead. Bye. I'll just make another one. And that's where plant propagation comes from. So I think it's super fun to think about that with all the plants that we're planting, we are literally just joining them, right? Like Mm -hmm. we're just like, Hey, I know you want to make a ton of babies. Let's go. Let's do it. Let's freaking do it. Let me help you out. I got you. I got you sister. Yeah. Yeah. I got you. One of my lines in my book, I don't think anybody's ever quoted it, but I like literally read it to my husband. I was like, this is the best line. And it was like, I think it was basically like, if you're impressed with microchips or whatever, like seeds are a million times more impressive because last time Mm -hmm. I checked microchips can't have babies and it's like, it's relaxing, right? It's more fun to just kind of go into that. Like, look, I'm just partnering with this plant. This plant knows exactly what to do at every stage of its life. It has survived for millennia and it's going to survive for a millennia more. And it knows exactly what it needs. All I have to do is think about it. Think about the nature that it would grow on its own end and just do my best to recreate that for it. And it's like refreshing perspective. That makes me think about, and I really do want to get into some gardening questions with you before the end of this interview, but that makes me think about, I had the most amazing voice teacher when I went to college in Houston at Rice University, where you used to live. And my teacher used to say the best singers just get out of their own way. And the best teachers just allow the voice to be what it naturally wants to be. And they don't put their own shit on their students' voices. And like the best singers just allow their natural voice to shine through. And it sounds very similar to what you were just saying. So that just makes me remember my voice teacher who was amazing. So I'm still solidifying exactly my land and plot. So we're going to figure that out. I'm sure after this interview and my outro, I'll have updates by the time this episode airs. But a question that's come up for me as I've started to plan my garden and a few questions that listeners had, when you plant your beds, Mm -hmm. if I'm going to do three beds, should I do a bed of lettuce, a bed of cut flowers and a bed of like peppers and eggplants and tomatoes? Or should I mix everything in? So like, how do you match make plants? How do you know, especially in a large bed where it's just kind of this open free for all, like, how do you know what to put where? Yeah. So if you see my beds, I mean, you can see in the book, like I'm very unconventional (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I'll watch, like you mentioned Joe Gardner, I'll watch him. He's like, here's my pepper bed. And it's just Mm -hmm. like 20 peppers. I'm like, I have never thought that way. (laughs) (laughs) It's just fun that we can all create our own style, right? So mine was out of constraint. So I would be working with a client where we would set up, say, two four by eight beds. That's it. Like we're in the city and they just have 
64 square feet of garden or even less. I would have a client who just did one four by eight bed. And then I gave them their plant preference list. And they're like, I want tomatoes, peppers, lettuce, arugula, herbs. Like the list Mm -hmm. was exhaustive and they just had one bed. So that constraint actually allowed me to discover something, which is all these plants love growing together. And in fact, they're kind of made to do that. So if you look at all the different, as you know, in my book, I talk about plant families. And once you learn plant families, you'll also realize that most plant families have similar size characteristics. So most of the Solanaceae plant family are all large. Most of the Fabaceae family are about medium size. Most of the Asteraceae family, which is lettuces, they're mostly small. And so if you think about it, it makes sense that you could group them all together. So the way we plant our gardens both for rooted garden and the way I teach my kitchen garden academy students is we do large, medium, and small, and we mix them all together. So you have to be careful about timing, right? Like it needs to be the right season. So when you're in high summer, you're not going to put in lettuces because that aster family loves cool season weather, but you could put in some herbs or basil, things like that. But yeah, if you'll look at my gardens, most of them are tapered. So if it's a border garden, it's going to be like tapering down the front. So large plants in the back, then medium, then small. And then if it's a plant that, I mean, a garden you can access from all four sides, then it's going to be tapered to either side. So tall plants down the center, medium, and then small. A lot of people, like a catchphrase everyone loves to use is companion planting. I don't know. It's kind of like one of those terms that makes you sound smart, I guess. But for me, I don't really love that term because I think it creates this like, woo, like, does this plant exactly match with this plant? Let me look it up and have a list of 500 plants I need to know. And that to me is a barrier of entry, which I don't like. So what I teach my students is more understand the plant families and understand what season they grow in. And there are a few exceptions, but literally the word is few. In general, the rule would be if it's the right season and if the sizes complement each other, then it works. Does that make sense? So for instance, like if you have a tomato, it grows in the warm season, it's a large plant. And then you have basil, which is a medium or a small size plant, and it grows in the warm season, then boom, those are going to work great together, right? But if you have lettuce, which is a cool season plant and okra, which is a hot season plant, even though those sizes work together well, those plants are not going to work well together in the garden because they grow at different times. What about shading out though? If you're planting like a large plant right next to a small plant? It's kind of an idea that works sometimes. People love to talk about it. I mean, it will work to some degree, but your air, like for us in Houston, I'll say like there ain't no shading you can do to get rid of 105 degree real heat. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, like the plant can feel that heat, whether it's getting sun or not. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that is more temperature rather than light. So you might be able to microclimate it a little bit, but it's pretty tough to try to grow. That's when the gardener gets exhausted. When they're trying to grow plants outside of their optimal season, that's when you feel overwhelmed. Because every time you look out there, the plants drooping and like wilting and you're like, I got to go water. I got to go do this. That's what overwhelms the beginner gardener. Like the first few seasons I gardened, we were trying to grow tomatoes and cucumbers in Houston summer because we were like, it's summer, it's time to grow tomatoes and cucumbers. And literally, Maria, like I would drive up on the driveway and all the cucumbers looked like they had just passed out, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was because they don't grow then. They grow from March to May and from August to October. So timing is super critical to like releasing the pressure that you have on yourself. Okay. And when I had asked like a small and a medium, I meant like tomato and basil. So what if I plant the tomato and basil next to each other, but what if the tomato shades out the basil? Oh, I see. You're seeing it more like as they're at the right time. Is it going to prohibit the basil from growing to its full extent? Yeah. Yeah. I don't find it shades it. So if it's, I mean, maybe for part of the day, but like So my gardens are facing, um, they're like on the south side of my house. The sun comes up in the east. So like, let's say I have tomatoes coming over my arch trellis and I have basil on the inside of the trellis and the outside. Yes, that basil on the inside with that sun coming down, it is going to get more shade. But if I was more thoughtful, I'd put the basil on the outside of the tomato and then put something that wouldn't mind shade, something like arugula or something on the inside. So you can kind of- 
through that. Well, actually, because this brings up assessing where your garden faces. Yeah. Because should I line up my beds with south? You know what I mean? So yeah. my plot is unobstructed light. It's like a in the middle of a clearing. Yeah. But is it important for me to try and like angle my beds towards south? Or is it just important for me to understand where south is? And that's where I should be mindful of the slope of the size of the plants. Yeah, that's the what you said the second time. Okay. Got Basically, it. once you know, like you know where the sun is, and then if you know the plant's habit, then you're going to go, okay, I'm planting this tomato. It's going to grow on a six foot trellis, right? So I can envision six feet of tomato. The sun's going to be over there. So all the things that are in front of this tomato plant, they're going to get the most sun. And all the things that are behind this trellis, they're going to get the least amount of sun. Got it. So you just kind of plant that way, like mindfully as you put stuff in. Got it. Okay, cool. And then cut flowers. I loved your Zinnia video on your YouTube channel. And I'm really excited at the idea, something that my mom does with her garden in the summer that it's joyful to watch her do it, but I can't wait to do it myself is whenever we have visitors come over or whenever we go and visit someone, she picks a quick bouquet of herbs and flowers from her garden, wraps it in tin foil, like it's very low, it's not fancy. And she always gifts some herbs and a flower to our neighbors or whoever we're visiting. So zinnias, obviously, I mean, I know you love zinnias there in your garden. Do you have any suggestions for flowers for me? And do you suggest that I start them from seed or start them ahead of time or do a seedling? Yeah. So I prefer starting flowers. I've had the most success with the easy to seed flowers. Personally, when I found buying flowers, unless you're buying from like, I have a local CSA here that I can buy flowers from and I totally trust them. When I buy them, they're not bloomed out. They're just green seedlings and those do fantastic. But what I've generally found is if I buy from any kind of plant store or a place that's not for sure organic, they have pumped those plants so full of synthetic fertilizers to bloom them out before you buy them that if you don't keep doing that, once you buy them and plant them, they literally will just sit there. So I can't tell you how many times that happened to me. So I have so many clients who are like, I can't even keep this marigold alive that I got from Lowe's. And I was like, Mm -hmm. well, nobody can. So you're okay. (laughs) Because they know it won't sell if it doesn't have the big blooms on it. Like Mm -hmm. they're not selling for the informed patron basically. Mm -hmm. And so they bloom everything out. And I've just found those things. They might sit there with their blooms on them, but that will be the end of the story. So all my zinnias, I start directly in the ground from seed. I have started some of them indoors, but Honestly, the ones that I direct seed, they take over. They end up being more prolific. Okay. Zinnias are in the aster family, the lettuce family. Like lettuce plants don't like their roots disturbed either. So I grow those from seed. I love marigolds in the garden, especially if you grew like the big ones. There's like Kilimanjaro from Baker Creek. They have a white one that's just gorgeous. And then there's there's like safari marigolds. The blooms are just really huge. They make a some like gem marigolds are too small, I think, for a cut flower. They're still beautiful in the garden and great for pollinators. But the larger blooms on the marigolds, those are super easy to grow from seed. The seed, the plant is fantastic at making their seed. It's awesome. Calendula is actually a pretty cut flower. It's also great in the garden. It's a trap crop. So you could put those in your raised beds alongside, all these actually could go in your raised beds alongside your plants. Will they flower in the first season? If I plant them from seed in June, will they flower for me this summer? Definitely. They're all annual. Okay. So they finish, oh, great. finish okay. the whole life cycle. They'll go from seed all the way to full bloom, all the way to producing a million new seeds within 120 to 150 days. Okay. I've heard to plant, to line your beds with marigolds because also marigolds are, they deter pests, right? Yeah. People say that. (laughs) (laughs) To be proven, right? I mean, I get the smell. You'll smell the smell. Like there is a distinct fragrance from marigolds that I think does, basically it doesn't deter pests. It throws off a scent that would distract a pest basically. So like a pest that's smelling lettuce or something. They won't be able to smell it as well because they'll smell the... Got it. Do you have any suggestions? I have to put some sunflowers in my beds to honor my mom who has 300 sunflowers in her front yard every year because they're obviously so much taller than the rest of my garden. Can I do a sunflower in a raised bed? Yeah, it's a great question. I did sunflowers. I'll send you a picture. Remind me. 
I did some sunflowers in my beds last year, right mm-hmm. alongside my cucumbers, which was really fun. Go for the smaller ones. So teddy bear is a great okay. miniature sunflower. There's a bunch of miniature sunflowers. So just don't do like the mammoth. <laughs> yeah. You could, I mean, ones. you could, if you want to, what I did is I think I put mine in the corners, but probably if I had to do it over again, I would put it along my trellis line. So I would have like my cucumber trellises and then I'd have the, the sunflower because it was more similar in height to those trellises when all of a sudden. Oh, that. cool. Okay. I've started three different types of cherry tomatoes, indeterminate okay. cherry tomatoes. Awesome. Let's describe this for the listener. The way that Nicole grows her cherry tomatoes is she has her two beds that are parallel to each other. And then she has an arched trellis connecting the two beds. And then she trains her cherry tomatoes to grow up over the trellis and they meet at the top of the trellis and go over. So there is an entire trellis dripping with cherry tomatoes. And I am obsessed. I cannot get the image out of my mind. So first off, man, trellises are expensive. Where can I find a trellis for under a hundred dollars? Nowhere? No, you can't. (laughs) I mean, you can make like, it's all over the internet that making one with a cattle panel, you can do that for Mm. under a hundred dollars. I wouldn't buy a trellis that's less than a hundred dollars. I wouldn't. So I would either make one with the cattle panel and the rebar. That's going to be less than a hundred dollars or I would save my money. So here's the deal. I mean, you might be able to make fine one for under a hundred, but it's probably not going to be well constructed or hold very well. That's okay. the problem. You realize you're about to put like, like if you do it the way I do it, you're going to have tons of plant mass on this trellis. I mean, mm-hmm. like the first year I even tried with my clients, I did a cattle panel and I had to go back throughout the summer and reinforce it. That's why I don't do it anymore. Cause I had to keep going back into the garden and reinforcing it. Cause the cattle panel kept sinking mm-hmm. under the weight. Of okay. The- so you're thinking like a hundred pounds of plant mass, maybe. I mean, it like it gets Got really it. So that would be my recommendation. If you want to go under hundred dollars and do it with budget, cattle panel is a great option. And you could literally do the cool thing about cattle panel is you could literally line the entirety of the bed. So, and you can squish it up right against the edge of the bed. So you could go edge to edge and you'll have all that metal, like more than my trellis, you know, my trellis is just right in the center of the garden. So you would have that entire length. So you could do like 20 tomato plants or something like that. Oh my God. That's the way to go cheap on the trellis is do the cattle panel. Okay. So in order to train it, I watched your YouTube video. I'll link it in our show notes. It's all about training the leader stem. So you can't let too many stems go, but how do you recommend like figuring out how many cherry tomato plants to put per trellis on each side? Do you have a recommendation for how many minimum to have in order to get that desired effect? Yeah. So, you know, what's funny. So the year I wrote my book, I think I might've put four on each side because I look back at those photos and I'm like, that was packed. Like Mm -hmm. that trellis was so full of so amazing. This past year when I did it, I think I only put two on each side. Like if you look at this year's photos of my trellis, it looks a lot less full. And I think that's the reason. So I think I did four in four on each side. So that would be eight total plans in 2019. And then I did four total plants in 2020. So uh, this year I'm doing eight. I'm doing four on one side and four on the other. Cause I definitely missed that. I still had a lot of tomatoes, but I missed that. So the general rule, like if you read the books, generally people say tomatoes need to be three or four feet apart. I put my tomatoes about 18 inches apart. So what I'll do is like, if I have on this side of the trellis, if you think about it, there's a way where you could plant those plants where they're still 18 inches apart from one another inside of a, say three square foot space or two square foot space, something like that. So my trellis is not quite two feet long, but almost, so you can kind of stagger the plants so that in general, they're about 18 inches away from one another. And then, yeah, like you said, so the most critical time for getting this set up is in the first, say two to three weeks where you want to be pruning, just quite carefully watching and keeping your leader stem alone and then Mm -hmm. letting that leader stem get nice and thick. So you want to think about this is the support for a very large plant. So letting the plant really put its energy into great root formation, really nice, thick main stem. And then you kind of prune as you go, as it grows. I'm so excited. I got to figure out my trellis situation. I got to do it. 
And that is another thing that I know as our homes grow and as my garden grows, the tomato trellis. And um, if I wanted to do like tomatoes on one side and like another vining plant, like a cucumber or a zucchini or a squash on another side, I also have tomatillo seeds that I've started. Like, can I do more than one type of plant on one trellis? Absolutely. You can totally do that. I typically, like if you'll look at my rooted garden clients or gardenary students, generally I'm a big symmetry person. So like if you were letting me plant your garden and you, you only had one trellis and you wanted tomatoes and cucumbers, I would plant, like if we're facing going into the garden, I would plant a tomato on each side on the front of the trellis. And I would plant a cucumber on each side mm-hmm. on the back of the trellis. In each bed. So okay. that I have the vine of the cucumber is so different from the vine of the tomato. So it could be really cool and whimsical. It's really the design and the look. That's why I love garden style because that will totally be beautiful. It'll just be beautiful in a different way. So it'll have a little bit more of a wildness and like a jungly kind of feel. If you've got this huge cucumber vine on one side and a huge tomato vine on the other. If you look at my book on the very first, I think it's on the page that says, what's a kitchen garden revival. I'm standing in a formal protege with my clients that big trellis has cucumbers on it instead of mm-hmm. tomatoes. So you can okay. kind of see the different, like what that plant mass would look like. But yeah, you could do pole beans on there. I mean, anything that's going to grow in a vining manner, you can definitely combine them. And then, you know, the fun thing is every season we get to explore a new way, right? So like mm-hmm. that to me is the magic. It's like, even though I had done that for tons of clients, done it in my own garden, Last year was a different experience and I know this year will be too. So it gives you like excitement to keep living, like to keep going to the next season to see what happens. It's a lifelong hobby. I'm very thankful for it. And I'm very thankful for you. I hope maybe we can have a check-in late, you know, midsummer check-in to see how the garden's growing. And I love to ask this final, this question to my guests, why as a fine kind of final wrap up, why do you think everybody should try having a kitchen garden? Yeah, I think everyone should try having a kitchen garden because it was the way we developed as humans. I think that we've had so much progress over the last 100, 150 years, so many fun things like the fact that I can talk to you right now and look at you and Mm -hmm. make podcasts and videos and talk to each other over social media is amazing. There's some things that we needed to leave behind from the past, but the kitchen garden was not one of them. So around the 20s, 30s, there's a great quote actually by Joel Salatin of Polyface Farm. And he's like, like in 1920s, our food was in our backyards. It was on the corners at the farmer's market. It's this gorgeous quote. I should have it for you. I need to come up with my own quote, I guess. But (laughs) it's like the food we ate was right outside. The food we ate was so close to our experience as human beings. And now it's not. Now it is thousands of miles away. It's shipped to the grocery store where it sits for days and weeks. And then it sits in our fridge. Like we're so far detached from food and food is how we survive as people. Food is essential to our livelihood. And so I am not advocating for us to become farmers again. I am advocating for all of us to grow a little bit of our own food to reconnect to this piece of nature, to this piece of the world that is essential to our growth as people. My podcast, I haven't recorded episode in forever. It's called Grow Yourself. But part of my kind of mantra is that when you grow yourself, you literally grow yourself. You'll learn so much. You'll get so much more out of the garden than just a tomato. Mm -hmm. As you can tell, I'm passionate about it, but I would love to see all of us by 2030. That is Gardner's mission is that by 2030, everybody in America is growing at least a little bit of their own food. Oh, I love that. And your podcast is great. I've listened to it. I've learned about sweet potatoes and I love your like specific episodes on different plants. And I have a series on my show, Life Lessons in the Garden. And I think you and I speak very similar languages when it comes to that. And it shines through on your podcast too. So everyone should go check you out. And where else on the interwebs do you and your brand live? Yeah. So gardenary.com is where your listeners can find blog posts and links to our courses. And you can find a gardener in your area that is a gardenary certified coach. I'm on Instagram as gardenary co Pinterest, Facebook. We have a Facebook group and 
I think those are the main places. I'm on TikTok, but I need some help from Maria there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing on TikTok either, but I'm having fun. So whatever. <laughs> yeah, we should all be there. That's where my kids are for sure. Yeah. But yeah, mostly best way to reach me personally is Instagram at Gardenary Cup. Cool. Well, I can't wait to stay in touch. I can't wait to grow. I think you really hit on something. I love the concept of that this is a lifelong hobby. And I know I have a lot of anxiety about this first garden, but also I think I know that it's not going to be perfect and I'm going to learn and it's going to be an ever growing thing. And therefore I will be an ever growing gardener. So thanks for being part of my journey and I'll see you on Instagram (laughs) because you know, I watch all your content. (laughs) Me too. Well, thank you so much for having me, Maria. I feel like we are forever garden sisters. So I appreciate you very much. Absolutely. You too. Thank you so much to Nicole for this awesome conversation. I really, really adore her. You should go check her out at Gardenary on her Instagram and all of the interwebs. Check out her courses. She's awesome. I can't wait to keep you guys posted, plant friends, on my garden. There are a few things that are still in flux right now. I'm still not exactly sure where we're putting it. A few of the final pieces are getting put together, and I can't wait to report back. And I am just so excited to openly experiment and stay curious alongside you and kind of document this journey. It's extremely vulnerable for me, but super fun. I'm really fixated and fascinated with the concept of growing food this summer. I just can't wait. So thank you again to our wonderful Patreon supporters. If you are interested in getting on the wait list for this community platform that we are building out that I can't exactly tell you so much more about quite yet, head over to bloomandgrowradio.com forward slash community to get on the wait list so you get the inside scoop. And thank you again to our fabulous episode sponsors. I am going to go have a fine acre from Allagash with Billy right now. So until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section and leave us a review? It would be tremendously helpful for the show, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more planty content or ways to help and support the show or engage with our community, we've got a ton of options for you. So first, there's the free Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test. It is a super fun three-minute test that I made for you that pairs you with your Plant Parent Personality Profile, where you'll learn your planty strengths and weaknesses and get a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley tailored just for you. The test lives at Bloom and growradio.com slash personality and you have to let me know what your results are on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram at Bloom and Grow Radio. If you're interested in supporting Bloom and Grow Radio, consider becoming a Patreon plant friend of the show. Patreon plant friends are members of the community who support the show monetarily on a monthly basis for as little as $4 a month and these magical humans help support the show and bring our content to as many planty eyes and ears as possible. Once you join, you'll also get the secret password to our Facebook group, which I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. We have a lot of fun over there. You can become a Patreon plant friend at patreon.com slash bloom and grow radio. And of course, you can also just join our newsletter that I like to call the Garden Club. When you join our Garden Club, you'll receive a free download of the exclusive Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print, which is so adorable. And I'll slide into your inboxes, usually only around twice a month with plant care tips, recent episodes, and announcements. You can join at bloomandgrowradio.com slash community. And for anything else, plant friends, I'm here for you. So feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. Thanks again for listening. It is my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing.